All right, you have your word, you have your Bible. Amen, Ephesians chapter four. I'm gonna begin uh, reading in verse seven. Father, we just thank you tonight. We thank you for the eternal purposes of Christ Jesus being manifested in our generation. Lord, thank you for your plans, Father, that are being, um, Lord, established in the earth. God, we thank you for Breakthrough Worship Center. We thank you for the team here. We thank you for the saints that are gathering here in this city, in this region. And God, we just say your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we thank you for the birthing of churches and ministries built on Christ. Lord, we thank you that you're exposing, Lord, counterfeit foundation in the nations of the earth. Lord, let us not build on charisma or personality. Let us build on Christ. Jesus, would you come and reveal yourself to us? Would you come and enlighten the eyes of our hearts that we might know you better? Lord, release the spirit of wisdom and revelation in this room. Lord, open up your word to us. Open up our eyes that we might see things like never before. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. I have held this long-term belief that we have a lot of teaching in the church on the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the second coming of Christ. We have a lot of teaching in the church on the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the second coming of Christ. But when you begin to ask people, when's the last time you heard a message on the ascension of Christ, Many people have never heard a message on why Christ ascended. Some people can, uh, you know, reference Matthew 28 and the Great Commission and things of that nature. But in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul begins to unveil and reveal to us why Jesus Christ ascended. And tonight I'm going to teach on the fivefold ministry, but I want to connect it for you that it is understanding why Christ ascended that unlocks these five ministries to us. So in verse 7, Paul is writing and he says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of of Christ's gift. But to each one of us, grace has been given according to Christ's gift. How many of you in this room are born again? I think after this morning's meeting, I'm going to assume that we're all born again, okay? We gave the salvation call. We gave the re-enlist call, the renew the covenant call. So I'm going to assume that there's everyone here is born again. So Paul is writing and he is saying, but to each one of us, Grace has been given according to the measure of Christ's gift. So the wonderful news tonight is that every born-again believer in Jesus has been given grace from the Lord. So no one has escaped God's grace plan for your life. There are a lot of great def definitions out there on grace. I personally believe it's got to be more than unmerited favor. To me, grace is divine influence upon the heart. Grace is the Holy Spirit supernaturally being active and alive. Grace is like being aimed toward you tonight according to the power that works within us. So I'm grateful for the working grace has motion. I believe that grace is a person. His name is Holy Spirit. And all of us have been given grace as believers in Jesus. Paul also says that we have been given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. This is the Greek word metron. What this means is that we all have grace, but the measure of grace is different. The measure of grace is different. In other words, you could have grace to reach 10 people, but the person next to you has a metron to reach thousands of people. 
We're still on the same team and we're still working in the kingdom of God, but the measure of grace varies according to Christ's gift. Okay, so we have trouble with this in our generation because we're in love with jealousy and insecurity and pride. So some are strutting around acting like, you know, they're they're the man or they're the woman because they've been given a measure of grace to reach thousands. And then you have some people who are jealous because they don't have a blue check mark on Facebook. They don't have a million subscribers online. And we have to get comfortable and accept we've all been given grace in his family, but we've been given a different measure of grace according to Christ's gift. Are we, are we clear? Therefore, it says, when he ascended, speaking of Jesus, on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself, also he who ascended far above all the heavens, and I want you to underline this phrase, that he might fill all things. That he might fill all things. This is the Greek word palero, if you're taking notes, P-L-E-R-A-O, palero, and it means to richly furbish with a substance. To richly furbish with a substance. So I want you to imagine that Jesus Christ is ascending, okay? We know that he ascended. Paul is talking about he who descended is also the one that ascended. Why did Jesus Christ ascend? It's not a trick question. It's right there. That he might fill all things, that he might richly furbish with a substance. And what I've come to tell you tonight is he is the substance. Jesus Christ has come, and the reason why he ascended was so that he could fill the earth, and I want you to write this down, with a revelation, demonstration, and manifestation of who he really is in the earth. Jesus Christ ascended so that he could fill the earth with a revelation. You can't stop at revelation. You need to move in demonstration. But you can't stop at demonstration. When are you going to become the manifestation? He came to reveal. He came to demonstrate and he came to manifest the kingdom of God in the earth. And so Jesus has ascended so that he can fill the earth with a revelation, with a demonstration, and with a manifestation of who he truly is. I want you to repeat after me. It's all about Jesus. One of the major issues in the decades prior to right now concerning teaching surround fivefold ministry is men and women with an agenda have hijacked the fivefold ministry and made it all about themselves. And I believe in large portions of the body of Christ. People have rightly rejected fivefold ministry because it was too much about ego in building the platforms of men and women. And in this generation, what I believe is happening is we have a resurgence, a new interest, a desire to recover the eternal mysteries of God and begin to look at the way that we have built things and begin to ask the hard questions. So one more time, it's all about Jesus. 
We have got to keep Jesus as the head, as the cornerstone, as the foundation, as the lover of our souls. It's important that we build our lives on Christ. We need to build our marriages on Christ. And most importantly, we need to build churches and ministries on the rock-solid foundation of Christ. Paul takes the Corinthians to task in chapter 2 in 1 Corinthians when he says, I'm hearing rumors that some of you are saying some of us are of Bethel and some of us are of upper room and some of us, what is he saying? Some of you are of Paul. Some of you are of Cephas. Some of you are of Apollos. In other words, in Paul's day, there's already a jockeying for position. We're already doing the name branding thing. We're already trying to rally people around personalities and charismas when what God wants to do is rally people around himself. You know, the reason why there's so much church hurt is because the way we've chosen to build. We have chosen to build ministries and churches around men and women of God, and when they burn out and when they fail, we burn out and we fail, and it exposes that our trust was in religious tradition and not the Word of God. How are we doing? It's all about Jesus. The reason why he ascended was to fill the earth with all things. A manifestation, a demonstration, and a revelation. Now, how did he choose to do that? Read the next verse. And he gave some as apostles some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of of Christ Jesus. I want you to track with me. Don't check out, check in. Are you following me? Jesus chose, and we're talking about Jesus' plans, not man's plans. We're talking about Jesus' purposes, not man's purposes. Jesus chose to fill the earth with a revelation, manifestation, and demonstration of himself, he chose to fill the earth with himself through giving five ministries to his body. Jesus says, I'm going to release a revelation, demonstration, and manifestation of who I really am to my body, and how I'm going to do that is I'm going to give some as apostles, some as prophets, some as teachers, some as pastors, some as evangelists. I'm going to give myself through these ministries so that I can fill the earth with who I am. Now, those of us who have been attending church for any number of years start asking questions. For example, why do we only talk about pastors? If it clearly says in the Word of God that there are five ministries that Jesus has given His body to reveal, demonstrate, and manifest, why do we only talk about pastors? Where are the teachers? Where are the apostles? Where are the prophets? Where are the evangelists? It's interesting. If you look in the New Testament, 
the two ministries that are most mentioned are apostles and prophets. But in the temporary modern church, the two ministries that are least mentioned are apostles and prophets. We want to call anyone who we think is in ministry pastor when we could be wrongly labeling them and saying they have that kind of grace on their life when really they don't. I'm not here tonight to pastor bash. I very much recognize and honor the ministry of shepherds and pastors in the body of Christ. But what I'm telling you is they only represent one-fifth of who Jesus really is to his body. Now, I want to talk to you for a couple of minutes tonight and bring some language to help us understand the different fivefold ministries. If you're taking notes, I want you to write down a simple phrase. And the phrase is this Grace determines function. Grace determines function. When Paul would write in the New Testament, he would use the Greek word kata, which means in agreement with. He would make statements like this, in agreement or in accordance with the grace given to me, I say to every one of you. Paul is coming into agreement with the apostolic grace on his life and he is moving in a function that's been determined by the grace that he's been given. And so there is a, a marriage series that my wife and I have taught for years in the church. It's called Love and Respect. Has anybody ever heard of that marriage series, Love and Respect by the Egerets? And Dr. Egerets, he is helping couples, men and women, to understand uh, there's some differences between us. <laughs> Secular psychologists, they use these terms like men are from Mars and women are from Venus. And in this Love and Respect series... He's trying to help men understand women and women understand men. And he says something like, men see through blue goggles and women see through pink goggles. So the way that men understand women is difficult. Some ladies give me a shout. Hey, honey, tell me about the meeting. It was good. It was fine. It was great. And you're like, details. <laughs> We're on a journey. How many of you have been married a number of years and you're still on a journey? I'm still trying to figure her out. <laughs> Thank you for the laughter. It's good. You can laugh. My point is, in the same way God has made men and women differently, yet called them to be in unity with one another, apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists each wear a different colored lens according to the grace God has given them. If I were to call up an apostle, a prophet, a teacher, a pastor, and an evangelist, and I asked them this question, what is God saying to his body? Each one of them would respond according to the grace God has given them. There is something that I call divine tension where there is a tension that exists among the five ministries, and I want to again point it out to, it's more than five ministries. They each represent a part of Jesus Christ to his body. 
We know in the book of Hebrews chapter 3 that Jesus is our apostle. He's our high priest, our confession, right? So Jesus, the big A, has given little A's to his body. There is only one chief apostle. His name is Jesus. I know we make up titles. I preach in places. They're like master, prophet, chief apostle. I'm just like, Ugh. get over yourself. The reason why you've been given grace is to manifest, demonstrate, and reveal Christ Jesus. So God has given little A's, apostles, to reveal the big A, Jesus. He has given little P's, prophets. Jesus was a prophet. He was mighty in word and deed. Prophets reveal, demonstrate, and manifest the prophetic nature of Christ to his body. Jesus was the teacher. He was the Rabboni. They called him teacher. Jesus, as the teacher, has given little T's to his body. Are you tracking with me? He was the great shepherd. He has given pastors to his body to reveal that part of him. Jesus was an evangelist. He was the greatest soul winner. He still is today that we've ever known. And he has called some to be evangelists. So five ministries, each representing a part of Christ. And the moment we start thinking, I can pick and choose which ministries I like and don't like, really what you're saying is, I'm going to pick the parts of him I like and I don't like. It's more than just telling people, my heart breaks for you that all you've ever known is a pastor. It, it's not pastor bashing, it's saying, but what about the other four fists of Christ Jesus that were never revealed and demonstrated and manifest to you. It's more than, oh, brother, have more preachers in. We need more of Jesus. So apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists have been given by Jesus to his body. I tell people there are gifts from the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, they're laid out. Laid out in the book of Romans chapter 12. I mean, they're all the gifts of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has given gifts to his body, but Jesus has given five gifts to his body. The Holy Spirit has given spiritual gifts to his body, but only Jesus has given five ministries to his body. What's the difference between a believer who operates in prophecy versus someone who's been given the ministry of a prophet? The person that's been given the ministry of a prophet, they themselves are the gift to God's body. A believer in Jesus who's been given a gift of prophecy from the Holy Spirit, it comes and it goes. But if someone is called as a five-fold prophet to God's body, they're walking in a ministry that he's given them. I know for a lot of us, we've never heard of this, or we're like, you know, I don't know if it's deer in the headlight or you're interested again, but am I helping anyone? This, I, I'm, this, is, this is not some new teaching. I, I didn't get this from, you know, a, a, a rabbit in a hat. This is, I'm preaching to you the word of God. We have chosen to tell God in the West how we're going to build his house. I personally believe that the pandemic was God trying to drive a, heart, uh, drive a stake into the heart of celebrity Christianity. 
I believe that as churches around the globe shut down, God was trying to shut them down. He was trying to teach us a lesson that the way you've chosen to build a CEO model, a pastor does everything. How do we have churches on every corner and our culture is headed straight for hell? We are clearly, and it excites me in some ways because I think to myself, if we've had this much fruit doing it our way, how much more fruit are we going to have doing it his way? But we've got to talk about the tension that exists between these five ministries. Probably the most obvious and what we know the most about is pastors. Pastors are given over to shepherding and nurturing. These are the marrying, the burying. These are the counselors. These are the empathizers in our midst. How many of you thank God for pastors? We need shepherds in our midst. This is hospital visitation. This is someone has died. This is consoling your soul. Again, they represent the shepherding nature of Jesus. People ask me, why do you think, Jeremiah, that we do have five ministries, but for whatever reason, we just only talk about one? My answer is this. I think we put one in front of the four because they're the nicest. You know, you got a Sunday morning, people are coming, they had a bad week, they're discouraged, you know. Put the pastor up. His natural grace that determines his function is more coddling in nature. They're encouragers, you know, here's three steps to a better marriage and five steps to a better life and, you know, you're going to make it, you're doing good, you know, just weather the storm in the marriage, you know, your kid's acting the fool, you know, maybe give them a little pat on the butt, you know, and they rally people, thank you, Lord. You know, my cat's in a tree and, you know, Betty Lou died and, you know, we're wanting to get married, you know, I mean, thank God for pastors, but pastors naturally represent one-fifth of Christ, okay? Let's talk about teachers. Teachers of God's Word. These are line upon line, precept upon precept. If you ask a teacher, what is God saying to the body, they're going to tell you, we need more Bible studies. There's not enough discipleship in the church. People don't know the word of God. But if you ask the pastor, what is God saying to the body? They're going to respond out of the grace. The body is sick. The body is in need of encouragement. The body is discouraged. We need to pick them up and meet them where they're at. So the teachers, I tell people, the fivefold teacher is more than just giving out information. When someone is walking in fivefold teaching grace, here's how you recognize them. When they teach, they inject a love for truth. When you have heard someone, this is not a handout. Okay, this is not like you teach, I teach, we all teach. This is when someone is functioning in fivefold grace, your heart is burning in you for more of the word. You have a supernatural love. I need more teaching. I need more. And that's the grace that they release as part of Jesus as the teacher. I think that we know some about pastors. Some people are okay with teachers. Let's talk about prophets. If you would ask a prophet, what is the Lord saying to the body? Typically, prophets are going to tell you there's not enough repentance. We need revival. 
Prophets love to talk about dreams and visions and experiences. Prophets are connected to the Ruach, the breath of God. They love bringing forth the rhema. What is the Lord saying right now? And so when you ask a prophet what the Lord is saying, prophets are standard bearers. They're going to hold the line. And so when people are only used to pastors and they're used to coddling and comforting, sometimes when they get around prophets who have fivefold grace, it's uncomfortable for them. They're saying, what's wrong with this guy? Did he have, you know, he didn't get coffee for breakfast? He's up here ranting and raving about holiness and consecration and calling the people to, I don't want this guy, I want the pastor back. (laughs) And remember, the desire to pick one over the other is more than just, I like apostles and you like pastors. It's, It's, we are neglecting Jesus' eternal purposes for his church. That he would fill the earth with a revelation, demonstration, and manifestation of himself and how he has chosen to do this is through five ministries. Apostles. Apostles are pioneers. Apostles are wired to help the church think rightly about God's kingdom. Apostles are military type people. They are generals. They do not coddle. When you get around real apostles, they have one concern, your maturity in Christ. Listen to the words of Paul. I'm again in the pains of childbirth to see Christ formed in you. People make these these phrases. The church is a hospital for sinners. Have you ever heard that? That's true. But who is saying that is pastors. They are called to provide a type of hospital for the wounded, for the broken, for those that are struggling. That's the grace God has given them. But when apostles pioneer and they begin to demonstrate and they begin to cast demons out of people and you begin to get around them, they're trying to create a military base. Okay, you're in a hospital. Pastors want to go from room to room. How are you doing? How's your family? Tell me about your pain. Tell me about you. When you invite apostles into hospitals, they want to drive everyone out of them. They're going to bind every demon of sickness. They're going to rebuke the devil. They're not going to sit down and say, tell me how you got here. They don't care how you got there. They want to take dominion over every demonic spirit in your life. You call a prophet to a hospital. They're going to walk in. Prophets are burden bearers. They are feelers. I I tell the story, maybe I could bring my wife one time. The funny thing about the fivefold ministry is God has called me. If there's a test called the APEST test, and it helps you to identify fivefold gifting in your life. When I take an APEST test, I typically register 40 apostle, 39 prophet. When my wife takes an APES test, she is zero apostle, zero prophet, and 100, or I guess the top is 40, 40 pastor. You want to talk about opposites attract. My wife and I could not be further. You should watch her hear me preach. She cringes. She's like, oh my God. You know, she tries to pat my leg this you're too intense. You're going to offend somebody. And I'm like, the gospel's going to offend somebody. Okay? She's not prophetic. 
I'm so glad. I am thrilled that I did not marry a prophetic person. I married a normal person. She thinks all my friends are weird. The people that, you know, we invite Vlad and Isaiah and, you know, somebody's got, she's like, whoa, whoa, they're too much, too much. Talk about healthy marriage and family. You know, I hope you're understanding my, we love Vlad, we love Isaiah, but it's just the difference. So she loves Chinese food and she wants to go to the Chinese buffet because she likes the food. I don't like Buddha. So on a nice date night, she likes the atmosphere and the food, and I'm like, it's demonic. <laughs> and so I'm going to help some of you, because honestly, some, some of you, your marriage is nowhere near where it needs to be because you do not understand the grace God has given your spouse. You have to stop forcing them to try to see things you see. They'll never see it. Now, do I sit down with Buddha because I love my wife? Yeah, I don't worship him, but I remember one more story because I, I like laughter. I, I really do. We were like on year 10 for our anniversary, and she looks up this you know, place in the mountains, you know, it's nice and trails and hiking and, you know, she's very excited. So we get in the car and we drive into the mountains of North Carolina. And as we're entering into the city, I'm like getting hit with the spirit of witchcraft. I'm telling her this city is demonic. I don't know what they did here, but I'm telling you, there are witches and there are whatever. And I kid you not, I never forget, we're at the anniversary dinner and I'm like twitching out. She's like, honey, isn't the food great? And don't I look amazing? I'm like, yup, and I'm struggling. So you, you have to learn how to navigate. And again, this divine tension. Apostle, what is the Lord saying? It's time to father. It's time to mobilize. The apostle says it's time to raise up an army. The apostle says you don't need more counseling. You need to get in the prayer room. You need some demons cast out of you. You don't need more counseling. And the pastor is saying, whoa, apostle, what are you talking about? So in Ephesians 2.20 it says that the foundation of the church is built upon the apostles and the prophets. Apostles and prophets are foundation layers. I don't believe that the fivefold ministry is a hierarchy. This is one of the problems that I see. People, oh, the Bible says first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. So I'll just pick one. I want to be an apostle. And what they don't understand is the fivefold ministry is not a hierarchy. It speaks of a sequence in building. Apostles and prophets go in first and lay and unveil Jesus as the foundation, as the head. Let me just throw something out there. There are zero, zero, zero New Testament examples of pastors planting churches. There are zero New Testament examples of pastors planting churches. Why? They don't have the grace to do it. They have the grace to care and shepherd and love on people, but they do not have the grace to foundation lay the person of Jesus in His body. Wrestle with me. Guys, I, I graduated summa cum whatever, 4.0 from an Assemblies of God school in this nation. I did the teaching. I did whatever. They reject modern day apostles and prophets. All my classmates that I gathered with, pastor this and pastor this. And I'm asking them, but where do you see this in the Word? 
How have we created entire models and movements built off of paradigms that are not from the Word of God? And I'm going to take us back to we are more in love with celebrity Christianity than the New Testament blueprint. We want one guy. We are just like the Israelites. Give me a king. Because when you begin to realize team is God's idea, not ours... Have you ever heard of something called the Trinity? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit do three things. They promote one another, they prefer one another, and they defer to one another. You want some leadership strategy? Go to the Godhead. They promote one another, they prefer one another, and they defer to one another. Go back and read the life of Christ. I do nothing, I say nothing, unless the Father. Then he begins to reveal the Holy Spirit. They're promoting, deferring, and and, and deferring. So when we begin to develop team, I mean, Jesus did team, right? His whole ministry was based on taking a group of men and discipling a team and sending them out. The first century church is birthed in Jerusalem with a team. Then we see a team in Antioch. Then by Paul's third missionary journey, we have full-blown apostolic teams functioning. God is all about team. But this is why we have packed out services on Sunday and people don't come to prayer. You know why? Because we won't go unless the head guy preaches, but the only person that preaches at the prayer room is God. Folks, do do you realize how many churches and, and movements in America, if the senior leader died, they would fall? Overnight. And I can list them off for you. I won't. But that main preacher, if he dies, if he retires, if he falls, we have literally, we want, you know, multi campuses. I preach at multi campuses every year, but I'm still trying to figure out why does one guy need to be blasted on a speaker to multiple campuses? Do you know what that says to me? There's a failure to reproduce. You're telling me you haven't raised up and discipled and made room for... Folks, you know, there, there, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of saints in America have only ever been cared for and pastored, but yet they have never been mobilized and trained and equipped and exposed to other ministries. What about the evangelist? Peter says that we are becoming the dwelling place of God. Peter says that you and I are living stones that are being fit together and we are being grown together and we are being fit together and we are learning how to do life together. So I want you to look at evangelists as stone collectors. In the house of God, as living stones, we're being fitted together, built together, and growing together. I'm quoting you right out of 1 Peter. Evangelists go outside the house and they go find the dead stones... They preach the gospel, get them saved, and then they bring the dead stones back into the house of the living God and they drop off the dead stones who are now living stones who learn how to be fitted and built together. People ask me all the time, so if I'm an evangelist, my calling, of course, you know, you evangelists, Oh, it's all about the highways and byways. 
It's all about the poor. Forget church meetings. We don't need to gather anymore. There's a dying and there's a lost world out there. Amen. But it's only one-fifth of Christ. We need people in the highways and the byways, Luke chapter 4. When Jesus says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, he's anointed me to preach the good news, to bind up. He's giving us the job description of an evangelist. Here's what I see in America. The modern day megachurch, in my opinion, is when evangelists become pastors. When evangelists become pastors and get out of their grace and their lane, they build churches that are a mile wide and an inch deep. Every Sunday is a salvation call. They are operating in their grace. The harvest is ripe. The Lord has compassion. They cast the nets, but they don't understand. You're anointed to catch fish, but don't clean them. work together, recognize. So here's what I've seen. A lot of evangelists, this is this one ministry that's difficult because out of all five, they're most likely to be bivocational. Most evangelists should never work at a church or ministry. Why? You're a magnet for sinners. You don't need a job at a church. You need to be out in a sphere of influence where you can reach the lost. Don't, don't waste your time dreaming of getting a job at a church. You are exactly in the harvest field God has called you to. I want to help some of you get over a lifelong frustration. You are valuable, you are needed, but here's what I believe. Many evangelists, your main reason for attending and being a part of a church is twofold. One, as an evangelist, you inject the evangelistic nature of Christ to the body. Amen. But number two, your marriage and your kids need the church. I know too many rogue evangelists who have thrown the community gathering away and they're so burdened for lost souls that they can't even see their lost family. And they're at the outreach and they're, at, they're feeding the poor and their kids need dad. Or how we doing? I'm, just, I'm honestly just getting wound up. I could teach on six hours on this. Five ministries that Jesus has given his body. Apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists. Not one of them is more important than the other. But each of them is so uniquely gifted and graced that we have to work through the tension that they have because each of them have a legitimate burden from the Lord. Now, what I'm going to tell you is what I am preaching is not theory. I have been walking this out for the last 15 years. I have been planting churches apostolically and spending years building five-fold ministry teams who can equip the body for the work of service. We just planted another church in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I have again built a team. What does this mean? Team looks like sharing the pulpit. I, I do not believe that you fully endorse fivefold ministry if you will not give up the pulpit. I went into a church years ago. They asked me to preach on fivefold ministry. I did. And the pastor came up to me and said, Brother, that's a great teaching, but we don't need that here because I'm all five. I looked at him and said, So you're Jesus Christ? It sounded good, but hear the pride, hear the arrogance. Here's what it's going to take to see this function in the body. We need one another. 
How can the eye say to the ear, I don't need you? How can the hand say to the leg, I don't need you? So in planning churches and identifying the grace and the gifting that are on some, I want to go back to that for a minute. Many people are confused thinking every person has fivefold ministry grace. Wrong. Paul is very clear in Ephesians chapter 4. He gave some to be. If you look into the Greek further, it literally means explicitly. He explicitly gave some to be. In other words, not everyone has fivefold ministry grace. Not everyone is called to be an equipper of God's body. But again, this is not some contest. If you're sitting here tonight and you're like, I don't have fivefold ministry grace, I would say, Praise God. You have way less to answer for than some of us. You have grace. We read it according to the measure of Christ's gifts. You have gifts from the Holy Spirit. People ask me, why can't I just have a home church? I don't have a problem with a home church where there are believers, let's have some food, let's operate in gifts, but it's not a New Testament church if there's not five-fold equipping going on. Here people make these statements. I don't need the church. I've got Jesus. Jesus does not disconnect himself from his body. You cannot be equipped for the work of ministry to the building up of the body without five ministries. I get people are hurt. I get that they've had bad experiences. But folks, in our bitterness... Oftentimes, and in our unforgiveness, we try to create new models or new ways of doing ministry that are antithetical to the eternal purposes of God in the earth. So I've been planning churches and establishing teams. We begin to develop a rotation. So at our, our churches, we, we would have anywhere from five to eight individuals that were part of the five-fold ministry team, they and their wives. And again, according to the grace that they had been given, they operated. If someone in the congregation needed marital counseling, guess who they didn't see? You know, if you come to me for marital counseling, I'm literally just praying for a word of knowledge about how to get you delivered. Where's the prophet? Where's the apostle Jeremiah? I, I need... No, you need the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that's not functioning in him. But do you know how many people will leave a church if they can't have their king? Let's go there. When you begin to have a team and you begin to have individuals function, when we had one of our fivefold team teach the word of God, folks, there's no like crazy altar call. There's no demons. People are not shaking. They're not falling out. And I thank God. Why? They're teaching us the word of God. People walk up to me, brother, I like you better. I, I don't like Brother Barry. He's dry. He preaches the word. But there's really, when you preach, there's altar calls and there's miracles. And, you know, I used to say to them, you're not rejecting him. You're rejecting Jesus. So apostles and prophets as foundation layers, here's what I believe. Apostles and prophets most often function together because we most often understand one another the best. So in many places in the U.S., people are still developing this concept of apostolic centers. They're like, we don't want to do the church thing. We don't want to marry people, bury people, counsel people. We just want to cast demons out, host revival, mobilize the region. We want to do an apostolic center. 
so apostles and prophets work together and they engage in warfare and they call people to the front lines. But over time, things become dysfunctional because there's no pastoral care. And then you come over here where there's pastors and teachers and maybe a guest evangelist. And we have programs for kids. And we have things for marriages. And we're really getting people healed and we're getting to, but rarely there's power. Rarely there's deliverance. Rarely there's the breaking in of the Spirit of God. And so what's been happening over the last few decades is there's this war between healthy local churches and then other people over here who want revival, awakening, mobilization, training and equipping. And what I'm trying to help us to understand is there's no need to divide. But the only way we're going to have unity in the body is if we start learning and understanding the grace God has given us. Folks, do you know it might be appropriate to write a letter of apology after this message to someone? Do you know that it might be appropriate to write a letter to someone and say, you know what, I'm so sorry that as a church member, I put a demand on you that you could never function in because it wasn't your grace. Do you know how many people today watch YouTube? And YouTube is basically like your superstars. Give me the top five lineup of, of people that can cast devils out of, well, whatever. And then rather than recognize they have grace on their life clearly that's in a different metron and just leave it alone, we go to our pastor on Sundays and demand he operate in the same power. And literally half of these pastors are bivocational. You still won't get off your wallet and fully fund them but yet you're demanding that they act like your favorite YouTube star. So many people I know, they have demanded for years that a certain man or woman of God be who they wanted them to be and you need to repent. I'm so sorry for boxing you in. I'm so sorry that I demanded that we go out into the highways and byways when really you are a pastor. And you know why? Oh, man, you know why I had that burden? I'm called to be an evangelist. And I took my frustration out on you rather than responding to the call of God for me. So we've been building teams We've been planning churches and we've been sending out. And here's the thing. When you begin to function as a team, I want you to listen to me. The goal and the measure of success is not how many we can seat, but how many we have sent. We don't measure success by how many fish we can get in our bowl. We measure success by training and equipping the saints for the work of ministry. Folks, do you realize who does the ministry? The saints. You are supposed to be being trained and equipped for you to do the ministry in your sphere. This just blows up the whole consumerism. What are you going to do for me? What does this church have for me? Yeah. Now, some people will say, ah, this, this, is, this isn't for today. There, there's no more five-fold ministry. I want you to look at verse 13. It says, until. The Greek word is Until until we all attain to the unity of the faith 
and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. We will need all five ministries functioning until we reach maturity. When people start telling you apostles aren't for today, prophets aren't for today, I mean, pastors are for today. Ask them a question. So you're telling me we've reached full maturity in the body? The fact that you're saying we don't need all five is you revealing your belief that we've all reached maturity. And surely, you're somewhat saying, folks, we've not reached maturity. We have a broken, fragmented, we pick and choose who we like and who we don't like. And yet Jesus is still reaching out to his body in 2023 saying, will you let me in my house? Will you stop trying to find your identity in ministry because your identity has nothing to do with ministry? Do you know that nowhere in the scripture does it ever say Apostle Paul? We're so drunk on titles. We love positions. We love to be seen by men. It only ever says Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. What's happening? He's separating his identity from his function. Paul is a son to the Father. He's a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. His function is an apostle, but his identity is a son and a servant. Folks, I'm telling you, here's a huge red flag. When people start, start demanding you call them by a title, prophet this, apostle this, pastor this. Where is Jesus? How are we doing? I'm just scratching the surface tonight. He's given some, five ministries. People ask, well, how do I even know? But isn't that the thing? We don't even have any avenues for people to know. We, we don't even have any, any kind of discipleship or any, any kind of, of ways to begin to walk people through. Could there even be a five-fold call? And if there is a call, what does the process even begin to look like? You could be in this room and have the call, but it's in seed form. You're just immature. It's going to take years and years to be processed and be refined. But then you could also be in here and say, brother, I don't even understand this fivefold. I mean, I, I'm born again. And who you are in the body is you're a helps ministry. You are called to help the body of Christ mature and serve and get connected to these five ministries and help them accomplish the mandate God has given them. I want to move tonight into a time of activation and prophecy. I believe in the impartation of spiritual gifts as the Lord has given them to me. I believe that God has gifted me prophetically to help people discern and recognize the grace that they have been given. How many of you feel called to be more than a pew sitter? Please, God. How many of you recognize, wow, I've been called to do the ministry? Like tomorrow. Where you go to work, you have been called to do the ministry. And we are learning how to be trained. We are learning how to be equipped. And honestly, the thing that brings the most delight to my heart is when I heard that this is team leadership. When I heard that Dimitri, I mean, I hear Dimitri talking. I'm like, this guy is not a pastor. This is an apostle. 
I met him for five seconds and I'm like, oh Lord, I pray that the people at this church are not putting him in a pastoral box. I hope that the expectations that this congregation has for this brother are godly expectations. I hope that there's a plan in place to relieve him from pastoral work. And when you have a funeral, when you have counseling needs, you're okay that he's not called to meet with you. He needs to be in the prayer room. That's not because he doesn't like you. There is grace functioning on his life. And you're going to suck the life out of him telling him about 59 problems. I've met some brothers on the team this weekend. You for sure got some pastors here. But let's release an apostle, a pioneer, a father to function in the grace God has given him and make room for a team of pastors to emerge to do shepherding work. Don't worry, he's not paying me to say that. Like, I, I can't tell you. One of my number one assignments in the earth today is to go into churches and transition them from a pastoral understanding to an apostolic mindset. I know so many people that have placed Saul's armor on their leader. And they have strangled him in religious traditions and the church will never fulfill their destiny in the region unless we begin to build a team. How are we doing? If you want more, there's some books back there. We need your help, Father. I just, you know, I, I carry, a, you know, an, an international uh, American burden. You know, you, you just, you know, I was at a service a couple years ago and you know, it was a celebration for a, a senior pastor. And they were celebrating his faithfulness to his call. And he had preached in the pulpit for 40 years every Sunday. Big, big church. And they were honoring the faithfulness of the man of God. And I wept in the back. And do you know what I wept? I wept because that congregation for 40 years had only ever received one-fifth of Jesus. From a worldly, churchy perspective, thank God for the man of God or whatever, but I'm like they had their king. And they reaped what they sowed. But in this day and in this hour, God's going to raise up wineskins like Breakthrough Church. Where God has a father in this family who's going to raise up sons and daughters who are going to steward together the eternal purposes of God in this region. And if they're released to fully do that, I haven't talked to them, if they're released to fully do that, it will look like reproduction. There will be many churches. When you put prayer, the tabernacle of David at the center, it's going to challenge and confront people. Do you really want God or not? So would you just close your eyes tonight? I, I want to deal first with any any expectations that are in this room that don't match the scriptures. Now, I'm not saying you're in sin. Some of us just grew up in a model of church where we've only just been used to one guy our whole life. 
And tonight, light bulbs are going off saying, wow, there is more of Jesus. There is supposed to be a team. So just pray with me tonight, just for a minute. Father, we come before you. We thank you for our home church. Maybe some of us didn't even grow up in church. Lord, wherever we started out on our faith journey, Lord, we thank you. And we thank you for whatever pastor or whatever leader stepped forward and revealed and demonstrated and manifested Christ to us. But Lord, we confess tonight we're in need of an upgrade. We're in need of a greater understanding of your eternal purposes for your body. Lord, we ask for forgiveness. If we had an expectation of a certain man or woman of God that they were never going to be, we repent and release them to you, Lord. And we bless them. You will never receive from what you cannot honor. And so, Lord, we just honor that individual. We release them to you. We thank you for the foundation that we got in those early years. Just hear the Lord speaking over this body. I'm helping you to grow up, I'm helping you to mature. I'm leading you on into 2024. The greater awareness of fathers and sons and team. Lord, I pray that you would drive the heart. You would drive out of our hearts consumerism. Holy Spirit, speak to us about our appetite. What are we hungry for? Are we still demanding a king or have we fallen in love with the king, Jesus? Lord, deliver us of celebrity Christianity. Forgive us, Lord, for sowing and listening more to people on YouTube than our own church. Come on, I promise you, as you begin to get your expectations and your appetite right, there's going to be a fresh release of the Holy Spirit in this room. You're going to feel stirred to begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. If that's you, just begin to pray in the Holy Spirit. Fellowship with Him. Holy Spirit, we're asking for an awakening tonight. We're asking for an activation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, I ask that you would make it real and known to those in this room who you've called and chosen. This is not something we choose. It's something God chooses. Hear the Lord saying, I'm marking people. I'm stamping eternity on hearts. Some of us are running from the call. Lord, bring us into agreement with the grace that you've given each one of us. Lord, we repent of jealousy. We repent of insecurity. We repent of pride. Sia 
rabakaya robo si arabakaya raba mo ndarabakaya raba baba we're going to pray in the spirit for two minutes and then minister i just want you to pray in the spirit we're stirring ourselves up in our most holy faith shandarabakaya robo si araba Jesus, 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 Jesus. Lord, bring healing to marriages. Lord, you're giving language tonight to marital conflict. You're giving us an opportunity to humble ourselves, to repent, to thank you that you've given us someone not like us. Ha. Ha. The goal of marriage is not to make them like you. Just one more minute. There's a fresh release tonight. Rabakaya robo siaraba. I bind the spirit of fear here. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke the spirit of fear. Any fear associated to the call on your life. I command that fear to go right now in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, come. Just waiting on the paraclete. He's here. He's moving on hearts. He's awakening destiny. Lord, we repent of being lone rangers. If you need to repent for being a maverick, trying to do it on your own, saying forget everybody else, forget the church. Lord, we repent. Church was your idea, Lord. Lord, we say that we need one another. We need one another. Lord, bring the church of Springfield in unity bring the church of Massachusetts in unity Lord, I pray for divine encounters. I feel like some of you are beginning to feel a sense of a divine encounter, an arrestment, an apprehension, God apprehending you. Come into agreement with His grace. Stop frustrating His grace. Lord, I just bind the spirit of rejection. Every spirit of rejection, I command you to go right now. Some of you are fearing being rejected if you step into the call. I break that power of rejection right now in Jesus' name. Evil is increasing in America at an unprecedented rate. 
as the moral fabric of our nation is unraveling before our very eyes. The true church of Jesus Christ is strategically being positioned to host revival and bring in a harvest of souls never seen before in history. Satan is targeting the next generation. Suicide, gender confusion, violence, witchcraft, and immorality are all demonic strategies set up to destroy their identity and destiny. Like a lion on the prowl, the devil is seeking to devour the young and trap them in deception and lies. In the midst of so many dire problems and moral issues, God is knocking on the doors of his church and asking, what are you going to do about it? In the summer of 2023, God spoke to me and said, I want you to build a modern day Goshen where the next generation can draw near to me through encounter, discipleship, and activities. He asked me to purchase a piece of property in Kannapolis, North Carolina that was a former recreational park with 17 acres of land. As I stood on the ground and prayed, I received a vision of building cabins in order to host overnight camps for kids, youth, and young adults. I saw thousands being saved delivered and baptized in the pool. I saw an outdoor amphitheater for the preaching of the gospel and the worship of the one true God. I saw our ministry headquarters where we will disciple men and women in every sphere of society and produce media content that will tear down demonic strongholds and teach the truth of God's word. The hour in America is urgent. The need for the true gospel to reach a generation has never been greater. Will you partner with our movement, the Altar Global, to help this God-sized vision come to pass? We are in need of prayers and finances to begin our journey of building a modern-day Goshen. By coming into agreement together, we can help change the trajectory of America one life at a time.